Well, hello, and welcome to a Fragmentarium video conference. I am your host, William Duba, project manager of Fragmentarium. Today, our speaker will be Jean-Philippe Echard of the Musée de la Musique, Philharmonie de Paris. Dr. Echard will be speaking today on the fragmented library of the sounding box, waste paper, and recycled parchment in musical instruments from the 16th to the 18th century. Without further ado, I give the floor to Dr. Echar. Dr. Echar. Thank you, Bill. Um, hello, everyone. So, um, fragmented library of the sounding box. I am uh, the one of the curators in, uh, for the collection that is kept in the Musée de la Musique in Paris. So this is the French national collection. And I will take a few examples uh, about my researches in uh, about this collection and uh, dealing with uh, waste, parchments, etc. So uh, let's go back in the, to start with, um, in, the, in the past century, about 30 years ago, my colleagues, looked at this very um, unusual and rare instrument, a viola da mano made in, a, in, the, in Spain, probably in the 16th century. And they looked at the inside of the sounding box and you see these whitish strips that are uh, in fact um, parchment strips used to reinforce uh, the structure of the sounding box. Indeed, as many musical instruments, um, all these strings instruments are made of very thin boards of wood that are assembled in the lightest way as possible because this is uh, beneficial for the sound and the work functioning of a musical instrument. But obviously this uh, thin piece of board of wood have to stay together in a mechanical structure stable enough to resist to the tension of the strings. So uh, we find sometimes reinforcing materials inside the sounding box of these instruments. And my colleagues 30 years ago looked inside that instrument that arrived like this open, that is the soundboard was unglued was already separated from the rest of the instrument. And they could see inside these strips and they would see, um, they would see writings there. So this is, to my knowledge, the earliest memory of observing fragments in a string instrument of the Paris collection. Um, this was uh, even studied by uh, a colleague at the IRHT, the Institute for the Research on History of Text in Paris. And it was notable exactly to uh, find the original document it was from, but he could, was able to document a few words and to date the script to the 13th century. So this is like the very start, if I may say, of the archeology span of fragmentology in the Musée de la Musique in Paris. Now, the main content of my talk will be about two uh, recent case study of my researches, the fragments in, that I found in three instruments made by Antonio Stradivari, and also another case study about a, a Bolognese lute. Then I will uh, follow with several dis with discussion on the uh, links between fragmentology and the history of musical instruments. So let's start with this um, guitar by Antonio Stradivari. Antonio Stradivari is very famous for his um, violins and cello, but in fact, there are a couple, not, not a couple, actually six, about six surviving guitars that he made also. In fact, in the past, he made lutes, mandolins, even a harp. So he was a maker of several types of instruments. In this um, guitar, one find a, a delicately carved rosette, which is closing, uh, partially closing the sound hole on the board. And about 15 years ago, when I radiographed the instrument, I was surprised to see on this rose, 
uh, strange features, strange images ap appearing on the X-ray radiograph. And they um, encouraged me to, to do further examination uh, on this. So I used another imaging technique, which is a photography-based technique, which is called endophotography. So it's a specific optical lens, a specific optical device inside a long rigid tube, which can enter little openings in uh, sound boxes. In the guitars, there is often on this, on, on this very end of the instrument, an, an, uh, a hole existing to fit the end button. This is where you attach the strap when you want to hold the instrument on your shoulders. So this existing opening is um, eight millimeters wide and it's allowing to, to fit inside an endoscope. And this is an optical system which allows making photographs so they are not perfect photographs, obviously, given the geometry of the artifacts. There is a very limited uh, field of view, and uh, you need to rotate the fiber, the endoscope. And there is also a little prism, a device that is allowing to capture images in vario various orientation. So typically, to image the inside of the rosette of the guitar, we had to do I had to make all these photographs and then to, to try to arrange them with uh, image processing, to assemble them, to merge them into a single image. This is an uh, interesting reconstruction, but obviously it's not perfect. There are geometrical uh, distortions, for instance, and the reconstruction process is not optimized. So we are able to, to, to see under the OZ that this is white. It's not wooden here, it's a whitish material. And there is writing that can be seen in some areas here. And actually, there are 13 lines of writing and we understand and you understand for sure that it is a text block. Reading this text block, is, uh, is very interesting. And it, despite the lacunae that are in this text because of the holes in the sound hole, it's possible to identify this text to one psalm. So the psalm 148. And these are several verses of one psalm. So it's interesting, but maybe we could do more. So with, with my colleague, uh, Ulfa Belaj and Marie Ratpon, who are uh, scientists in the same research unit as I am, uh, we, we were able to uh, make chemical imaging of the sound hole of the guitar. So uh, briefly, and not, not to get too technical, this analytical technique also allows, sorry, to um, detect the atoms, the elements that are uh, composing the, spotted, the spot that is analyzed. So we are sending X-ray beam and collecting re-emitted fluorescence X-ray beams that are char characteristic of, of this, of that atom. And it's a very um, interesting technique for works of art uh, and heritage artifacts such as this guitar because it's non-invasive and it's also moving. So the head is able to move step by step in order to collect a, a multitude of points. And this allows to create chemical images um, corresponding of each, to each of the elements that are detected. So on the upper left uh, corner, you see the fo a photograph of the imaged area. And then you see chemical maps of all the elements that we were able to detect. I, um, I will talk about copper and mercury, but uh, the iron is usually the most used for writings because of iron gold, gold inks. And here we detect obviously iron gold inks, but the two texts of the recto and the verso of the leaf are detected together, overlapped, and they're too difficult to read. This is also the case for copper, which is signature for azurite pigment. 
and mercury, which is signature for vermilion pigments. And this is the ones I'm going to discuss now because they are kind of easier to interpret. In fact, um, when we have this false color map of the two elements, copper for the blue pigment azurite and mercury for the red pigment vermilion, we see here that there are more initial initials of the verses that are detected than the one that, can, that we can see with endoscopy. In fact, by subtracting uh, one image to the other, that is subtracting the initials that are visible on, on, the, um, on the endoscopy from the chemical images, one is able to uh, retrieve the initials that are not visible by endoscopy, that are the initials that are on that are written, sorry, on the side of the leaf, which is now glued, um, glued along the wood of the rosette. And interestingly, we see that these initials correspond, correspond to the verses that are preceding the verses that are read on the uh, visible side, which means that this is the same soul continuing from one side, the glued side, to the other one, to the visible side. And we can say that then the visible side is the verso of, um, of the leaf and the glued side is the recto of the folio leaf. So we have now a feature of one big fragment for, for me, I would describe it as a big fragment about nine centimeter diameter with a block text of 13 lines, and we are able to, um, to describe this uh, text and the material feature of the fragment. Now, I, um, I was, once I had figured that in the instrument we keep in Paris, I was very interested in studying another guitar, which is the best preserved guitar by Antonio Stradivari of the six or eight surviving, and it is now at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. So I went to Oxford and uh, I was able to do endoscopy the same way of the rosette of the guitar. You see that the rosette is uh, the same uh, technique of making, but way better preserved. You see all the fine carving, wood carving and decoration, the finest ones are completely preserved on the guitar in Oxford. Whereas in the Paris guitar, it has been strongly damaged by people in the past. So on the Oxford guitar, on the Hill guitar, we, I was able to do the same thing with endoscopy. And thanks to the very good state of preservation of the rosette, uh, I was able to discover a, a very nice fragment and uh, with the text which was way more readable. And Again, we have a 13 lines text block with similar dimensions and again, upsolms, upsolm. Uh, with, it has the same writing. So the, the writing was um, uh, identified by Laura Albiro, my colleague who collaborated on this research. Laura Albiro at IRHT. And I thank her, obviously. Thank you, Laura, for. Um, identifying the writing as a uh, thousand textual, textualist writing from Italy, from the first half of the 16th century. There are initials alternating blue and red, and they are uh, decorated also. So we have hints that we have two fragments that have a lot, of, a lot in common in the two rosettes of, uh, in guitars of Antonio Stradivari. While I was in Oxford, um, I also studied another violin by Stradivari, which is kept there, and it's uh, he is called the, the Cipriani Potter. He is made in the same time period than the two the two guitars in the 1680s, and it has a very rare features among violins by Antonio Stradivari. This is the the ribs, um, so the sides of the box. They are uh, decorated by Stradivari in a very interesting technique. 
actually the, the black lines you, you see now on the picture are uh, made by uh, carving the, the piece, the wood plates with a very little chisel, which is carving little gutters inside the wood. And it's filled, then it's filled with a black paste to, to fill this carving and to create the floral design that you see here. This means also that locally behind these black lines, the wood is thinner than where is no line. This, is the, this means the, the rib structure, the wood structure is more fragile than on a regular violin where such carving is not made. Inside the violin, in fact, I observed again with endoscopy other fragments uh, that were in, in a way re reinforcing the back of the ribs, probably because uh, they had been thinned locally to, to create the design. So you see on, the, on one side of the violin, um, shots, endophotography shots of uh, the text or decorations I was seeing on the bass side of the violin. And if, if you, we switch to the treble side, this kind of side of the violin, more fragments. So they are all of similar height and, um, and showing uh, different lengths and showing most of them writings. We were able to identify the text on these fragments, and we were able to uh, suggest or imagine a possible reconstruction of the fragments by uh, comparing the photo endoscopy um, and uh, what was known about the devotional books and prayers uh, of the time. So you see here, it's not perfect again. I could not compensate for every geometrical distortion due to the um, geometrical distortion induced by the specific object uh, lens, photographic lens of the endoscope. Also, the surfaces on which are glued the fragments are curved because they are the side of a violin and they are at various distances. So this is a tentative reconstruction of where the fragments could have been specially in an original folio. Bifolium. In fact, it appears that given the, um, the content of the text and the geometry, that all the fragments that are in the violin come from a single bifolium. And this is one very interesting uh, feature. So to, to sum up with this um, uh, first study on, on three instruments by Stradivari, we we were able to um, find that uh, fragments coming from the same dismembered codex are to be found in three different instruments by the same instrument maker, two guitars and a violin. All these instruments are dated of the same period, and there are at least three bifolium, bifolia, sorry, three bifolia used to uh, create this reinforcing material in these three instruments. When I started this research, I was interested in, in studying the history of uh, these instruments, the, history, the materials and techniques used for these instruments. They have been created almost at the same time. But when uh, we discovered the fragments, there is something else, else happening, and it's opening uh, way more widely the, the scope of possible research. In fact, when, when we unearth the fragments, we recover them, in fact, virtually, because we only have digital images of them, uh, they exist again now that we have uh, detected them, identified them. And it's bringing, uh, it's enlarging the timeline of the life of the object. In fact, it's not only the time of creation 
of, that is important for every of these musical instruments is the fact that before the making of these instruments, there were no, not only wood, glue, varnish, um, gut for the strings, etc. that is raw materials. There were also prior objects, man-made objects that were books that were uh, later dismembered to be recycled, reused, reused as part of inst musical instruments. So we are very happy, Laura and I, that um, this research on, on the three Stradivaries, this research I, I showed you, has been accepted for publication by the journal Fragmentology. And thanks to the editorial team, the article is published today, I believe, and uh, Bill will probably tell you more about that uh, very soon. So if you want to know more about this research, please this, read the article. We will be very happy of your feedback. Now, I would like to, to show something completely new, uh, which is a, a work in progress, and it's involving my colleagues in the Musée de la Musique in Paris as well um, as, as other colleagues of the research team. We, we keep in the collection uh, another instrument um, that is very, interest, very interesting. It's a very old lute. It's one of the five, I believe, surviving lutes by the maker named Lox Mahler, who was uh, working in Bologna in the first half of the 16th century. Um, this is the current state of the instrument. That is, uh, like the viuela, the first instrument I showed you, the board is, uh, the sound board is currently separated from the rest of the instrument. Actually, it is a remain of an instrument, the remains of an instrument. It's like a rune, if you want to say, because this object has had a very complex material history. Um, this has been studied by my colleague, Sebastian Kirsch. The object itself, as a lute, was trans transformed over time uh, to, to be repaired and then to be converted to a baroque guitar and then uh, partially reconstructed between bracket to its original state by um, musical instrument repairer slash restorer. And um, the Musée de la Musique decided to purchase, to purchase to them the instruments to stop this restoration back to the original in order to keep um, this uh, great uh, material testimony of the 16th century in the best state and to keep most of the original material that were left as possible. So this object is open, so we don't need an endoscope to look into it, and it's, um, it's great. And we are going now to, to look inside the bowl, inside the sounding box of this lute. In fact, there are a diversity of materials reinforcing the inside of the bowl. Uh, the bowl is made actually of, of nine uh, ribs, nine flat pieces of, of wood that uh, I may go back, uh, ribs that are going back, going to the neck until the end of the instrument. They are curved and um, shaped onto a wood mold and onto a wood shape. And this thin piece of board are adjacent to each other. So there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine ribs constituting this curved ball for the lute. So it's a very light structure. You would be surprised when you weigh a lute, how light it is. And inside, to, it's not sufficient to glue side by side the adjacent ribs. It needs to be reinforced. But there are too many, I would say, materials reinforcing that. There is uh, diverse type of clothes, wood patches, parchment, paper, you see on the uh, left, uh, left hand side, uh, printed material, but also handwritten material. And it's very complex to, to read at first. So 
uh, one of my students, uh, Salome Bleudet, studied very carefully this summer uh, the, this reinforcing materials. And she proposed uh, the, to reconstruct the stratigraphy and to make a, a map of all the materials that had been added to the original ribs of the lutes. So she was established, sorry, she was uh, uh, able to, um, to, to identify at least 10 strata of materials. And um, all of them have not been documented yet, but we, we focused on the deepest two strata. These two, uh, like the lowest, the closest to the wood, strata A are uh, made of parchment strips, all bearing writings, and they probably correspond to the time of the making of the instrument itself, the original assembly of the lute. So you see here in, in blue with the map of uh, the fragments in the first layer, and in red, the, the map of the fragments in the second stratum. And um, here already it's kind of interesting in the his, history of the making technique, the, the technique by the maker, how he uses parchment strip to consolidate the wood structure when he's making or just after maybe he has removed the ball from the wood shape, wood internal mold for making that shape. You see um, fragments that are glued along the joint, covering the two sides, one rib on one side, the other rib on the other side, along, along all the joints, and some of them going perpendicular, and then some of them oblique, obliquely placed in the second stratum. Now I will focus uh, my discussion on the first layer um, to, to be more in depth, to go in the, in the reality of the work that Salome and I did and with Sebastian. And um, we identified 19 fragments. 18 of them are very long thin strips, up to 25 centimeters uh, long. But one of them is more rectangular and it's here probably to compensate for a defect in the wood of the rib structures that was identified at this moment. Parchment is almost transparent. In some cases, you just see the ink on the wood as if there was no substrate and you need to use UV light to see there is parchment. So probably the leaves, the parchment leaves on which the text was written were very thin. And among the 19 fragments, uh, 10 of them uh, had writings which were, at least in part, readable. So Salome, with the stereo microscope, read very carefully, carefully and was able to identify um, the text. And they are all, all the texts are coming from the Old Testament, from the Bible. And um, you see, this is a schematic of of each of the 10 uh, strips on which text was deciphered. And it's very consistent. It's coming from three books of the Bible. And um, um, we have not gone that further into the, the writing identification, etc. But for the materiality of the original leaves, we were uh, able to um, conclude that the writings were similar on all these 10 fragments with also very consistent writing features such as the initials that are with red uh, little dots. Um, the line eight is very consistent. The column width is very consistent. And um, this is typically uh, a schematic with a few dimensional information we have on what was possibly what were possibly the dimensions and feature of the original uh, bifolia from which these fragments were taken. As for the bifolia, uh, we, we think that there were three bifolia to, uh, to, that were cut to have all these fragments. Um, 
and uh, probably two of them were adjacent in the same choir, given the relative position of the extracts of the various biblical texts. So, of course, we, we, we could go farther on this and uh, we, we would need to collaborate again with a paleographist, etc. This is really a work in progress. I'm just showing you research that is very recent and actually not fully terminated. But I thought it would be interesting to share that with you. As for the upper stratary, uh, and you see here a detailed photograph of a fragment in the second stratum, uh, well, it's to be continued. Uh, hopefully, we will have uh, research fellows, etc., going on on this route. Now, uh, and to to conclude my uh, my conference, I would like to open up discussion on um, uh, on um, questions qu uh, about disciplines, fields, and skills. In fact, I, I have the feeling that uh, here we have several academic disciplines that are at stake and uh, several questions also that could be um, raised. Uh, some of them are dealing with the history of the text and history of the book. And uh, this is the, let's say, sub-discipline or the approaches that are fragmentology, material history of text, of books as well and their destructions, uh, paleography, etc. Uh, and I'm not at all a specialist of, of all these fields. And on the other uh, side, there is the history of musical instrument, which is often named organology, which is to understand uh, the instrument making techniques and the history of these techniques and the use of various materials, which is also the material history of each of the instruments of the past that are preserved until now. Also, it is linked to the cultural history of the instrument, uh, about the circulation and trade of musical instruments, etc. Now, if we think, for instance, about one of the Stradivari instruments uh, we've looked at in the beginning, but any musical instrument which is containing fragments used to reinforce the structure and like the maker has used, has used fragments, re waste parchment, waste paper to, to create his instrument, to make his instrument. Actually, as we said earlier, the timeline is, is longer than just the life of the instrument because before there is a life of a document. So when I say before the instrument, there was a document, it's because I'm coming from the field of the history of musical instruments. Historians of text or of books would say, first, there was the history of a document, then the, the book was dismembered and fragments were cut out, and then after a musical instrument was made. Actually, this is not fully important. The thing is, with these musical instruments, the fragments had been forgotten. They were mostly invisible during the whole life of the instrument. There was, it was unknown, at least to us, or at least for the past century for all these instruments. One didn't know there were fragments. And then all of a sudden fragments are unearthed. Uh, fragments are seen and they are documented. So, this is telling us about the creation of the instrument. And also, if the instrument is modified, as it, were, at it, as it is the case in the lute I showed you, it was modified in the, 16th, in the 17th century and uh, maybe in the 18th century, and there are probably fragments added again at that time. And when we document all these fragments, it's bringing, of course, new information on the history of musical instruments. And it goes even to confirming or, or, um, or in the contrary, uh, removing the attribution or contesting the dating of the instrument. It gives information about the sources material that were um, purchased by the instrument makers, etc. cetera. Uh, 
but also these fragments. They bring uh, the shed light on texts that were unknown to anyone. So they were unknown written fragments. So when we decipher uh, a Bible, probably a one volume Bible in the lute, or a book of hours in the, in the, via, in the instruments by Stradivari, this is not, uh, this is new documents. The texts are obviously known uh, to historians, but still one may find one day texts that are unknown and that were unknown to the historians of the text. This brings me to uh, my last point, which is uh, the idea that sounding boxes of musical instruments are indeed libraries. I showed you a couple examples on which research has been going on recently in Paris. But just to tell you, I, I believe there, are, there is, just in the collection I'm in charge of, probably tens, maybe 100 instruments in the collection that, are, that is containing fragments. Maybe not all of them are medieval fragments. Maybe some of them are early modern fragments. But still, um, you see in this citern, we see di diverse type of fragments also reinforcing the joints of the, of the body. And there is this type of writing. And this other parchment, probably a repair, uh, is bearing different types of writing there. And it's, we need to document it. I mean, it's, it's the beginning of it. Also in, in this very interesting um, bass violin of the 16th century that was later transformed to a cello, we see various strata of uh, parchments and some of them are bearing writings, some of them are not. And all this needs to be again, studied, um, studied. So these are just a couple a, a more example of, let's say random, not exactly random, but instruments that we have in the collections. And to finish with, um, on, to come back to the Stradivari guitar, which, is, uh, which was at the beginning of my talk, uh, I mentioned the rosette and the parchment, but the ribs are covered with paper fragments with handwritten uh, text on them, which is uh, currently under study uh, in our team. So, in fact, sounding box are fragments library. In, you could, we could see these um, boxes. They are not rectangular, but they have like the soundboard could be seen as the ceiling of the room. Uh, the, the back of the instrument could be seen as the floor of the room and the ribs as the walls. And it could be one reading room of a library. And they are closed containers and they contain texts. Actually, the conservation conditions are quite good. Uh, the fragments have not been handled for years, decades, or centuries. They are, the, the cases, the, the sounding box are almost closed because the openings for the sounds are very small. So there is no handling, almost no dust. Ah, the problem is that the fragments are glued on wood. Okay, so one side is not readable, but we've seen that with um, advanced uh, scientific imaging techniques, one can imagine accessing also the back and the glued side. So there are, like in every library or any archive center, uh, there is a specific and sometimes li limited access to the fragments. Sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's straightforward. But the important thing is that there are many, many libraries like that. There are many historical musical instruments with sounding box containing fragments. And most of these libraries are still to be explored. Explored and then ob obviously cataloged. This is the end of my uh, presentation. I will be happy to have your comments and questions. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the, the great, great team uh, in the Musée de la Musique and the CRCC
in my research unit, so Marie Ratpon, Ulf Abelage, Sebastian Kirsch, Salomé Bledet, who was a student with me, and also Alexandre Gillon and Constant Vétillard, who were also students who participated to this project. And to all my friends and colleagues from other institutions who collaborated and gave me very fruitful advice. And especially thank you to Justine and to Laura Albiro for her uh, great and generous collaboration. Thank you all. Um, well, thank you very much, Dr. Eshar. Uh, we now have time for questions. Well, one of the other quest obvious questions we have then for you is, how do we proceed? How do we, you know, how do we get at this library? I mean, you've shown a few techniques there. What physically are we going to have to do to get these fragments? We first need to, there is various levels of, let's say, survey. Mm -hmm. uh, first, we can imagine from the making technique of the instruments, which are the ones that, which instruments probably would have fragments. Uh, fragments would have been required so that the sounding box stay together. And so this is quite easy from a musical instrument museum perspective. Then uh, it, to go further, uh, one can imagine X-ray uh, radiography is quite simple or endoscopy is quite simple just to look inside. The problem is often to look inside the instrument. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the very thinly carved uh, rosettes of flutes and guitars sometimes don't allow to go to see well inside. So this is where uh, to go. And then uh, X-ray based techniques. So the chemical imaging is great because it can retrieve uh, iron gold inks. And this is mostly where the, uh, the composition of the inks of all these writings. So we can imagine ad accessing the text, probably CT scans, micro CT scans, com computer tomography scans uh, can, can be also made. And, but all these techniques are kind of uh, time consuming and requiring some heavy, heavier instrumentation that is usually not mobile. Um, uh, so uh, we need to adjust exactly uh, the energy into it mm -hmm. versus the risk of not finding anything. Um, okay, thank you. Professor Morant would like to speak. Yeah, thank you very much. It was very interesting to hear about your findings. I have a question. Uh, did you think about maybe why this fragment type of fragments were used? So as I've seen most of them were uh, psalm texts or bible texts not all of them have showed there was even an antiphone there mm -hmm. uh, may this have also uh, not only taking material which is at hand but may it also have um, let's say religious or even magic religious idea that it is put into the instruments to give a blessing to the instruments for example or like a, a religious context of uh, choice uh, choosing fragments like this. I, I thank you for your for your input. This is a, a really interesting uh, idea. I had not thought about a, a, a blessing or something like that. My my opinion would be I would be that the first used. Uh, parchment and paper for their, for their mechanical properties, for their practicality in the making of the objects. I was uh, struck or surprised in the violin, you know, in the ribs of the violin, that uh, the writing lines were parallel to uh, the main axis of the instrument. So, and especially in the first fragment I observed, uh, it was it was the Gloria Patri, and it was very easy to read, you know, straightforward. And I said, "Wow, there is a prayer which is presented all along inside the ribs." But in fact, following the rib inside rib, rib structure, I realized that some of the texts were upside down, and some of the texts were glued. There was not a sequence because he glued at some point one side or the other side of the strip. 
So I say, I think that maybe he didn't care that much about the writing when, when doing that. Uh, but who knows? <laughs> yeah. We have a question from Emanuela Vai, which is fascinating research, Jean Philippe. Could you provide any details on the acoustic implications of the presence of these fragments? Oh, thank you, Emanuela, for being there and um, your question. My colleague Sebastian Kirsch would be way better answering, and I will connect you too. My answer today would be uh, almost none. Uh, no acoustical, uh, uh, it's not like in the primary order of the physics of the vibration, but one also the strips are essential because if there were no parchment, the, the sounding box itself would be a fragment. <laughs> so all the parts would not stay together. So it would not be a resonant cavity and vibrating cavity. So they are both uh, unimportant and essential. Excellent. Here you have uh, uh, Professor Christoph Egger says, thank you for this fascinating paper. Just an observation. I think that a similar type of reuse took place in organ building. I remember small pieces of written parchment being reused in the pipes of the great Baroque organ of the Basilica in Weingarten, Italy, uh, Germany. Th thank you, Dr. Egger, for, for, for this comment and this insight. I didn't know about that specific organ. Um, <clears throat> it's starting. You see, this organ is also a library. Um, uh, this is wh what could be organized. And we could think, I don't know, of the fragmentarium structure, database, etc., to start creating a, a catalog of, of these fragments. One thing I haven't mentioned um, yet is that um, what one would not, in general, remove the fragments from the musical instruments to keep them apart and, and to, to read them or to preserve them separate from the instrument. Because they were objects, but they are also part of an object, which is a musical instrument. So the, the conservation condition is complex. The accessibility is complex. So we need to find a way to properly catalog these fragments. In a, and we probably need to develop uh, an adaptation of, uh, of the usual cataloging of fragments that, are, that is frequent for, say, in book bindings. And in the case of musical instruments, it's slightly different. Thank you. I think everybody's mind now is spinning about uh, how to use this. You know what what the what the implications are for things like provenance mm -hmm. research. Oh, you know, it is. Have, yeah. Um, yeah, provenance research, and I would be very happy to to know more about uh, the trade of parchment leaves of parchment leaves once dismembered. Because um, what we could find um, uh, is that, let's say, when parchment books codex were dismembered in monasteries or in, in universities to create book bindings for more recent books, there was like a chain of supply which, is, which could be very local and which was related also maybe to a or religious organization, or say, in a monastery, for instance where the books were everywhere. So there will, would be some kind of a reusing of parchment of old books in the same structure. But what about a violin maker, an instrument maker, a lute maker? Where would he get the, uh, the, the parchment leaf in the 16th century or the 8th, 18th century? Um, to whom would he buy? What were the circulations of, of the materials, who were the traders, and uh, in, in which quantity was it going from, to, to, from cities to cities? Was it very local? Um, could, could have these uh, books been in the family of the makers? It, it's possible for the Antonio Stradivari family, for instance, because we have only one example of uh, one book of ours in a three instrument by this maker so far. Mm -hmm. 
But for Lux Mahler, the maker of the Bolognese lute, at his death, his workshop was containing 400 lutes that were finished and ready to be sold, 400. And uh, ribs, plenty of barrels full of ribs to create several hundreds of instruments. So he probably had uh, a, a supplier for parchment leaves. We have counted like the parchment surface in the lute for one stratum and the other stratum, and it's big. And we, we are almost able to, to, to count the parchment surface necessary to, to make one lute. And uh, there was necessarily a trade behind that. And I would like, I would love other historians to contact me and tell me things about that. Well, um, we have, there's, there's quite a few fragmentologists working with Bologna, Bolognese sources. So uh, you should be, that, 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 that sounds quite promising and possible. All right. Looking forward to it. Yeah, looking forward. So, well, I, I thank you again uh, for a fascinating talk and uh, it was a lot of fun. And I want to thank everyone for attending. This is our uh, last uh, Fragmentarium video conference of 2021. So I wish you the best holiday season and an even better 2022. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you.